All right, welcome everyone to our episode of Quantum Healing with Tina and Karen. On today's episode, we have a special guest with us. Um, he is a researcher, philosopher, and multiple author. And he has recently published um, his latest book, which feels like, I said, the perfect summary of our YouTube rants. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the book is called Exit the Cave, Ending the Reincarnation Trap, Howdy McCoskey. So welcome, Howdy. It's really nice for you to come and join us. Um, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and how the culmination of events that got you to this point in your research. Wow, that's quite the question there as an opener. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for having me. It's going to be interesting to do an interview with people who are uh, understanding the subject or talking about the subject. And so um, it's good. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Uh, simple answer for you. I was a fairly normal Canadian growing up, played hockey, um, was a stand-up comedian for 10 years, but went through uh, went through some, a lot of difficulties and a lot of trauma in my life. Got to the point where I thought about committing suicide, and that's where I um, that's where I found uh, a documentary by on uh, Egyptian pyramid building, and it gave me a complete new purpose in life. And then I started 25 years ago <clears throat> researching ancient Egypt and alchemy and hermeticism, and wrote the book Power of Then. At that time. I uh, got very fortunate to have met a uh, Korean monk, uh, several native medicine men, Qigong teachers from China. So I was very fortunate at who I met at that time. I began to think I knew everything, that I was quite, quite <laughs> smart. And then I had a death experience in 2005, which was a combination of blessing and curse at the same time. Uh -huh. I've gone through uh, uh, extreme openings from that experience. And I've gone through years of bizarre illnesses and challenges that's come from it, mostly from rejecting the experience and moving in directions that I think the experience didn't want me to go. Um, I took some time off, a book about that came out. Then I wrote a book on the world fairs and the expositions in 2019. And that kind of what exploded the a YouTube channel for me. And uh, But it was about a year ago that I started getting back to the original subjects I was researching 25 years ago, which is the honesty of what is this realm? Why are we here? And what's really going to happen after we die? And every time you open one of those boxes, it's never a positive answer that for, for the me thing that I see looking in the mirror. It's, it's a, so that I took like four or five months and just intensely went through all the things I used to research, a whole lot of new stuff, and got the book out ready in, in uh, September. So that's the short overview of how I got to this point. And um, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. I thoroughly enjoyed reading the book, I have to tell you. I thought it was so, it was like you took all of the thoughts that were mm -hmm. swirling around in my mind, organize them in mm -hmm. this perfect fashion. Yes. Put them yes. down on paper in such a, a thoughtful and grounded down to earth way. Mm -hmm. I think that exactly. if someone who is not familiar with this information were to pick up your book, they wouldn't be scared off by it. You know, I think yeah. sometimes this conversation can become so intense that it scares people away. Um, yeah you know, considering the possibility that things might not be all rosy when we leave the body. Like most of us live our lives thinking, okay, we get through the suffering here and then we're free. We go to heaven or, you know, the higher yeah. realms or whatever that is, and we're free. But then this conversation comes into play and it can be quite scary for people, you know? Yeah, I try to let people know a couple of things usually as we're doing these talks have never, especially have never bumped into me and my material is that I, I'm probably going to sound very negative to a lot of people. That's how it's going to sound because a whole lot of things that people are holding on to as belief structures and hopes kind of I, I'm not going to play with those games. And so I sound negative, but I'm actually it's actually quite positive. If you actually get to the end, the positive part of it is actually truth. The positive part of it is actually yes. knowing your situation, actually knowing who you are and, and what you're doing in this realm, actually not as a concept, but to get there, there's a whole lot of walls and barriers that have to get 
busted through. And that's not fun going through the walls and busting through. And like you guys, you know, I don't know for sure what's going to happen after we die. I don't know for sure how and why this realm was created, but I have a pretty good thesis now. I have a pretty good working idea of it. And it's it's being presented so others can take time to think about it, contemplate it, figure it out for yourself, but don't be afraid of it. Just because the material is difficult, it might actually be your real freedom. Right. Absolutely. Yes. I love that. And I think people probably think that about us too, that we're um, coming from a more negative place. And we've battled with that. Um, you know, when we started to come out with this information that we were seeing in our sessions, you know, that doesn't align with the the mainstream spiritual narrative that's out there. It's like we're busting through that mm. now, these old spiritual beliefs that people hold. And, you know, those can be very confronting when you're first yes. going through. Yeah. Right. And it's hard for us too, especially like going in the field, like, um, like as a medium and relaying messages that aren't in alignment with even my own current belief systems and being like, okay, well, but I have to say it because I can't just go with what I feel is true. And, and then going with that, it's, it's been really validating to, to have people like you come out and say things that are being found at least on the energetic level and validating that. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's got to be challenging for you guys as doing session work uh, because if someone's coming to you for a session work, you know, they're, they're coming with some hope. They're coming that I can, that yeah. I can improve, I can get better, I can heal. And so they're looking automatically for positive reinforcement. And so it must be challenging when the first wave you sometimes have to give them is actually but you know what? Here's what I got to tell you first. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah, so I can see the challenge for you guys. Absolutely. Um, I was telling Tina last night about that one quote that you wrote that pretty much summarizes our practice. And I thought it was so compelling and profound. And it was like, and no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And I was like, yes, I go, this is what we're trying to teach people. I go, don't be fooled by this program. Like everything, like when, you know, like reptilian grandma comes to welcome you back in the light, like don't go to her, like bust her face and leave, like try to find an exit to get out of here. So yeah, yeah I thought that was really amazing that you wrote that because it felt so, um, so resonant and how, again, like our mission is in trying to find the truth and, and it has to, yeah, like you said, you got to bust down all those walls, belief systems, and it's really hard for people with their cognitive dissonance to to try to consider a different way of thinking because yeah there is a lot like we want to have hope we want to be able to know that we're going to be reunited with our loved ones that we've you know we've shared lives with and we might not have to see them at all and it's like you know that kind of humanness we have to like detach it's the detachment that I feel is a challenging thing for a lot of people yeah, and I, I mean, we can start right with prayer. I mean, there, there's a there's a first thing that everybody does at some point in their life from when they're a young child, mm -hmm. and no one's ever really actually taking the first step of who or what am I praying to, yes. which is a really, you know, you're, you're presented like you're praying to this particular deity, angel, power, animal, whatever, but how do you know that? How do you know that you're not present, present, uh, presenting what you're doing energetically and turning yourself into prey? How do yes, you know exactly. you're not setting yourself up for massive manipulation? And so, but we also, on the other hand, see that prayer sometimes works. Prayer sometimes actually gets us, uh, gets us things in the dream that is helpful. So it's a really good example of not just instantly believing what you've been told and how you've been doing it, but really every single practice trying to take it to deeper and deeper and deeper levels like a giant experiment to understand what is this thing how does it really work what is actually in the best benefit for myself and others uh, and that might not be the normal way you've been taught to do things right like I told I guys read the book so you know about that story I had with learning about Jerry and the and how, and how to pray to blueberries and it was such <laughs> a, it just that was just a change of how to how to pray to yourself, we might say, was yeah. it's a massive turn in everything you've ever thought of. And that's kind of what all this is. It's just a massive turn of everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I thought that was really profound. And it, it's basically like 
being the thing that you want, right? So like you, with you, you were being the blueberries. And with, I think it was Jerry, it was, or the medicine man, was being the rain. Instead yeah. of praying for the rain, mm -hmm. it was like actually praying to being the rain. And it's like in within this realm, we have to be what we want to get that thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 yeah so the story we... so that people can hear what it is. I can tell a story so they know what it is. Uh, I've been talking about this idea with a medicine man friend that I still know, Jerry, Jerry Johnson. And uh, I had mentioned this idea of why are we praying to something outside of ourselves? We don't know what it is. Why don't we pray to ourself? And the story he shared was about 20 years ago in uh, somewhere in New Mexico or Arizona. There had been a huge drought for weeks or, or even months. And they had brought local medicine men in to pray for rain, but nothing had happened. And they finally brought a different medicine man from a northern tribe uh, down. And, and he did a ceremony and everything rained that night. And it rained for several days. And they finally asked him, well, why did your ceremony work? And he said, oh, the other medicine men prayed for rain. So when you pray for something, it's not here. I just prayed rain. And that was the realization of it's not, he actually then became rain first. So there was only rain praying to rain. So the only thing that existed was rain. So the only thing that could manifest was rain. And it was just this, <laughs> of course, it was like, it, it explained so much of the, of the hundreds of sweat lodges I've been to in my life at what was actually going on in there that, you know, I'm only seeing the base the front layer of it, but this was giving me an understanding of what was going on behind the scenes, what the medicine people were probably doing, who were getting the real intense, uh, powerful results. Yeah, like you say, they were becoming what they were praying to. Right. Mm. Yeah. And that that is so powerful because this is something we're always approaching with our clients because especially in the spiritual community and new age people that are coming out of new age and things like that everyone is looking outside of themselves to angels and archangels and even ets and all these kinds of things and really what this is setting people up you know because they're they come to us wondering why their lives are a mess you know and it's because they're connecting with these false light beings who are creating that mess <laughs> So it's trying to get people to understand that you don't need to, you don't need them, you know, like you don't need anything outside of yourself. And you're also giving your energy into that siphoning system when you're mm -hmm. praying to these beings or asking them for help, even when you just like send out an intention of, I need help. You're opening that doorway for any kind of beings to come into your life. <laughs> Or saying, oh, God, please help me. Who is the God that you're praying to or reaching out to for help? Most likely it's the Demiurge, right? Yeah. So you're, again, opening that doorway and then wondering yes. why your life is a complete disaster. <laughs> so we're always trying to get people to understand that they that the power is within them, mm -hmm. that they don't need to reach out to any of these beings for help yes. or protection. You know, a lot of people are reaching out for protection. Please protect me, Archangel Michael. And, you know, those kinds of right. things. And it's like, you have the power within you. You are the power. You are the power and you don't need any of those things. So I really loved that part in the book where you were also addressing that from a different kind of a different perspective. And it's really powerful. That's that story in itself, just it demonstrates the power that we are. And we don't need, you don't need to be a medicine man to do that. Like mm -hmm. you did it with the blueberries, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then one of the first lessons I ever got on that field was a different medicine man. This was Dennis. He was an Ojibwe from Manitoba. And I had gone out. I can't remember what the prayer was for, but we went out in the forest uh, and I took the tobacco and I made the prayer. And it was important that the prayer was thank you. That the only, the only part of the prayer that ever happened was thanking thanking in a sense the universe for what was what was going to happen so it was also there was no doubt it was just, or, or you know there's supposed to be no doubt because it, you're thanking you're not asking so i left the prayer and as we were walking from the tree he just turned to me and said now never think of this again so what do you mean never think of it again because it's happened if you think about it you're blocking it you stop it so it was also this idea of not only do you make the prayer, then you have to you have to you have to let it go. You just you just you just release it because if you don't, if you're trying to hold on to it and think about it and wonder about it, you means you don't trust. And again, that non-trust opens, like you say, doorways to all sorts of 
entities and energies to swoop in to, oh, you don't feel too confident. So I'm going to show you how to feel confident. That's kind of what a drug does. A drug does the same thing, right? A drug will give people an experience or give people a boost, give people something, but then it demands something in return. Always. There's always yeah. a payment you, let's say, have to make to the drug. And in many cases, prayer has an element to that. Even when prayers get answered, you will often notice people have to give up something somewhere else. And maybe they don't want to give that up, or maybe they don't want to have to do something else. But there's almost like there's there, there's been an, an exchange expected as opposed to true prayer, which just manifests. And what you give after that is just from your own gratitude. It's nothing demanding payment from you, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And in sessions, um, we've actually seen that these beings, they've admitted that they will create miracles. They will create healings, but they do so with an expectation of getting something in return. So they will give you something, but they will also take and or sign it. a contract in some way like to contract with you yeah 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 so do you want to kind of um talk about your overall vision of this realm i guess where we are right now what's actually happening here sure because that's a good foundational discussion point um normally everyone's belief is something like this some sort of loving God or creator created this realm so that we can learn and grow and spiritually evolve so we can one day uh, return back and join with them while at the same time making a place of where we can be uh, creative elements and have potentially all of our wishes come true. Even though some things are really difficult, those are there just to help us evolve and learn. So that's that what that's what the standard person would oh, that's believe. That's a really good summary. Yeah, that's really yeah. good. <laughs> So I've, I've had a lot of years to work to think this <laughs> stuff over, right? So um, I guess I now would sound much more like a Gnostic, much more like a Cathar, much more like a, a very unique part of ancient society, how they would think. And that is that you might say there is an absolute force. I don't want to call it good because I don't want to have labeling to it, but there is, we'll call it an absolute force or totality. And that totality is outside of what we think of as our realm, outside of what we call Plato's cave. <clears throat> and um, that force, however, through depending on the on the mythology, uh, wound up wound up with a second non-proper creator, an evil creator, which the, the the Gnostics call a demiurge, the Cathars call Rex Mundi, and, and they created a, a simulation, a, a copy, an artificial realm. And that artificial realm is layered. That's one of the problems when people think of something like the analogy of Plato's cave, they think of it meaning the material world. And so I have to escape the material world. No, no, you're talking the material, the etheric, the astral, the whatever realm you can think of, it's all part of these multiple layers. And this system, as well as I can now understand, is made simply to be a perpetual energy sucking system in a sense that if you think of it as a giant computer, uh, as, as our reality is like a giant computer. It's not, but it's a, it's a metaphor, right? It's a way of describing things. It needs a tremendous amount of power to run. And the best way to get the powers from the very simulated beings you have in the, in the in the computer itself. And that's what all of this is. All of this is really just a giant system designed to create enough power to go back into the system to keep the system running. Now, the, the positive part for all of us is we somehow got into this realm as actually essence. We didn't enter even as a soul. We entered as essence. And from essence, as we came into the simulated realm, we began getting, this was a really interesting thing I just learned a couple of weeks ago, is this idea that the soul is a piece of our, is that piece of essence that came in matched with energy. So it's energy and essence together. And this now becomes the spark that begins getting sucked deeper and deeper and deeper into the dream. So we call it a soul trap, but that's not even really true because even when you get back to the level of the soul, uh, there still needs to be a disconnection of the energy that as long as you're still attached to the energy, then you're still in the power. Like actually, you have to unplug the energy content to so all that's left is essence. 
And when there's essence, you are free to leave again. So we have to see that we were originally, uh, there was a temptation for us to come in. We took the temptation. And once we got in, it's become very, very hard to get out. And all that's been going on here is a suffering pit of hell designed for us to constantly suck out energy into the system with every once in a while bits and pieces of niceness to it. But mm -hmm. that's the system. And to me, yeah. the movies Dark City and, and the TV <laughs> show Westworld sum this idea up yes, perfectly. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it's it's so interesting that you bring up the the difference between the essence and the soul, because we saw something mm. really interesting in a session yesterday. And we've seen okay. this difference between yeah, before, like the essence or spirit and <clears throat> the soul. We've seen that before, but this came in a, in a different way. And Carrie, you actually saw it. So do you want to describe what you saw? Like in the bubbles? Well, what just the was? overall scene of what we saw yesterday. The overall scene that we saw yesterday, it was kind of like as if there was like this worker out there in the in the computer. And it was like looking out, I guess, outside of the matrix, per se. There's like a window. I guess that I, I, you know, of course, I'm a human. So I'm like trying to, it's filtering through me, the information. But what it looked like, it was like there was a screen that looked like there was sparks of light on the other side of it. And it was like within this computer system was able to take like a mouse, like, and copy all those specks of light and paste it into this world. So it was like taking the essence or whatever that was out there and bringing it inside and able to create and build souls because there was a part of that essence and then there was another color to it. There was the purple was the real essence or the copy. And then the other color was like this blue, which felt like um, a chip or a device or something like that. Um, which I alluded to being like, let's say the, the ego that will come in together with the soul or whatever, the, the spirit, I don't know what they, um, and so they were like in, encapsulated in these bubble things. And then they're brought to, I don't know, again, I like with the workers, I, I was trying to tap into them to feel like, are they evil? Is this like a, a thing? But they were so neutral. They're just doing their job. Mm, right. They're just doing a job. So they're bringing in the, those things. Um, next set of work, there was like a different kinds of beings there. They were taking the, you know, the essence ball things, looking at it like um, as if they're like looking at uh, diamonds, you know, just checking to see. And then it was kind of like they took them and just implanted them in a life or, or NPCs, like a non-player character, and just put them in there and said, okay, let's see what happens. That was like, I think that was the, was for the, the first life. life. Yeah. For this specific client, it was, this was the first life. So it was like a pure essence or a copy of a pure essence coming in a physical form, not having any skills, no survival skills already. Like the body was wiped. I was trying to tap in to see like, if, was there any information that was at least feeding or helping this soul in um, you know, having some kind of survival skills or anything to that effect. And I felt nothing. So there was a lot of terror feeling in the body. Um, not knowing, you know, having that, that feeling of hunger, like I recognize it as hunger. Cause I, I'm, I know it, I was nurtured to understand that when I'm hungry, I can eat or what, whatever, whatever. But in this right. case, it came in blind. Didn't know what the hell that feeling was. Didn't know what to do. Didn't know how to function in the simulation. And so there was a lot of suffering in that, the, the fear, because the ego part of it was there. Um, so we fast forwarded to the end of the life. And I think, I don't remember why she passed away, but it was, there was still a lot of energy stuck in the body because of not being able to deal or not knowing how to cope. And we saw, I think they took the soul out. So it was still in the bubble and again, passing it down the conveyor belt. And they're looking at it again, like diamonds to see what was going on. And um, the blue part, that was the, I guess, the ego part or the chip, the device was getting bigger than the actual essence. So I think that's how you, like what you said, you get more trapped in the dream. So because of, because of the suffering, because of, you know, not being able to, yeah, the trauma, 
and not being able to liberate. So it's like until we're able to understand how it works, the the trauma, the re, I guess re-remembering everything that we've been wiped up from, that we can come back into true essence and detach from that artificial attachment and then get the hell out of here. <laughs> I suspect that part might be what the Gnostics call the artificial spirit. Mm -hmm. could very well be that's a really really powerful piece of information actually and like I say that matches a lot of what I was writing in that final chapter and it also matches a lot of the near-death experience that um, uh, forever conscious research had a few weeks ago with this guy Kevin Lutz I don't know if you guys have seen that one but he oh, where yeah. he talked about as soon as it started these diamond like shapes started oh, yeah. coming out oh, of it oh yeah shoot yeah. yeah. And so there you are. So it's like right away, it's, it's diamonds, but he didn't say it was one, it was multiple. So it's also interesting that, that there could also be, which is something I've never thought of before. We always think there's, I'm a soul, I'm one soul, but maybe we can be multiples. There can be like the multiple souls within yeah. our, uh, within our, uh, ex within our material experience. But it was, it was such an interesting thing that matches just what you said. Yeah, yeah. I, I was a little taken aback by that because I mean, there's different, I felt like within this simulation or where there this specific work, because we were working with, with this specific soul, the way that she came in or was trapped in here was not how mm -hmm. we would see it in another way, like where people are, or people, where spirits or essences are coming in to contract to come in, like volunteers, for example, like I want to help here mm -hmm. or, and then they get trapped in here. This felt it was different so there's mm. it feels as if there are multiple ways within this system that they come and trap you in here so right. that way right. that way we can't just hold on to one absolute there's so many possibilities that we're seeing right. yeah i think it's different yeah. for each each person on how how we initially got here but yeah, but the the commonality between us all is that we were here and we keep cycling back in. Yes, once you're like in your deeper and deeper. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And something people don't, I think, realize is the layers of the how many layers of deception we are under. Mm -hmm. Just how many lies, how many deceptions, not just in the material realm, like you say, but in pre-birth realm, the near-death realm, the astral realm, the the layers of deception, the layers of false are so huge. I think it's one of the reasons people don't really take spiritual seeking seriously. And they choose to go to very nice, safe, simplistic things of meditate and mindfulness and, uh, yeah, not you know, here. something really, yeah, whatever, really simple, be love and light and be happy. And just because something in, in them knows, not only is it, is it difficult what they're going to have to see, it's so vast that they're going to have to eventually break through because Richard Rose gave me one of the greatest pieces of advice. I didn't meet him, but like from, through his books was um, if you want to, if you want a pathway to truth, you can't actually walk to truth because you don't know what it is. All you can know is what's false. And so your job is dropping false, dropping false. So in essence, what you're doing is you're walking backwards into truth. You just keep dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping until the one thing that you're no longer able to drop that's it. That's the truth. And it's the complete, back, again, something completely backwards to how the normal person attempts mm -hmm. any spiritual search of which I they claim, I know what the truth is. I'm just going to somehow make it happen in my experience. And then I'm, I'm done as opposed to, well, you don't know what the truth is. So you have to start with what can you find that's false? And mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. almost everything, right? Almost everything. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love that. That's perfect. Um, because that's exactly what we've been doing is just, you know, kind of moving through all of these different spaces and just like, nope, that's not it. Nope, that's not it. <laughs> that's not it, you know. And yeah. you're right about, you know, like people can barely come to terms about the deception that's happening in the material world right now, you know. Yeah. So to think, you know, and there's there's a, a belief there's a really strong belief that anything that happens in the spirit world is good and benevolent and all of those yeah. things. So, and to get through that belief is really difficult for people, I find. 
um, because it's like it's a higher dimension, you know, so it has to be good. And I loved what you talked about in your book. Um, I forget the specific words you used, but it was like the difference between uh, was it did you call it true good or real good or like the good that exists outside of this system and the good that exists here do you want to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that because I really yeah. love that sure yeah that's a very Gnostic kind of idea by Gnostic we mean uh, the group that kind of existed some if you believe the historical timeline somewhere around 2,000 years ago uh, mostly out of Egypt that eventually were credited for writing the Nag Hammadi fragments which is the the piece of Gnostic uh, gospels and understanding that still exists today. And the idea being that, in, in, as you can get this too through the Corpus Hermeticum when you read that, but that there's a real good, there's a, what they're calling true good, but that can never be found in this realm. Because as, as soon as good enters this realm, if true, if true good ever enters this realm, it's automatically, um, uh, when I say it's an what's the it's what's, what's the opposite to being purified you are you distorted. are distorted uh, yeah you distorted or you're you're somehow um you know you've you've become you become lessened automatically so as soon as as soon as anything enters this realm it, it already it already degrades itself so we got this first problem of this degrading and that's where the cathars for example the the group from france, southern france in the in the 11th and 12th century who was exterminated by the church of rome to them, they they claim we could not believe the Jesus story for the simple reason that if this really was the Son of Man put into flesh, he would have to be evil, like all other things in this realm, because good can't actually exist in a material form. So for them, the only way the story could be true was for this Jesus character to have been a hologram, to have been placed, in a sense, in non-physical form. Only then could good potentially have been somehow kept so as soon as as soon as anything enters any kind of material like form it's already splitting off so now when we get the splits now we have okay we have evil that's fairly obvious to see but good is not really the opposite of evil here good in this realm is just another avenue of energy collection mm -hmm. that's not coming from the evil nasty side it's coming from a from a, a side that looks nicer and feels nicer but the end result still produces energy for the system and that's i think what people miss because is that like the martyrs type many, energy yeah when you or just when you follow any spiritual tradition and your goal oh, is my. to feel good feel better feel more positive and in one sense, that's great. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's also this sense of, but if that's what you're going to hold on to, and that's only the reason you're doing it, you're actually more feeding the system than you are feeding yourself. And that's, again, this whole thing of having to shake people up to say, you know, if you really want to get to the truth of your nature, you have to get past this too. You know, this is a nice stopping point and it has use. Has, I, never, I never tell people that spiritual work or, or practices have no value. They certainly do. I've done hundreds of them in the course of my life but it's after a certain point of time you have to realize i've gone as far as i can with that it's time to drop that like anything else and move to other things generally people don't do that they'll keep the same practices the same things the same ways for 40 years and nothing happens so it's important to use a practice get the value out of it understand it let it go move on yeah yeah exactly that yeah yeah i think when you like the way you were talking about that too it's like um it reminds me of what I, what we would term false light you know and and it also kind of aligns with like there there is no true light here in the way that we think of it too the true light, light. exists outside of this system um so and that's the challenge all, darkness and light are the same thing here and people right. don't like to know that right yeah wow right yeah. That's so profound. But there is a true light that can be, yes, or, or can be connected to, but it's going to be surprising. It's going to be Sylvia in the Truman Show. It's, it's something from outside the bubble that sneaks in. Sylvia from the Truman Show. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, David and Jennifer in Pleasantville. Things that are outside the bubble that come into the bubble that actually don't make the bubble better. They create chaos in the bubble because they're presenting, hey, you're in a bubble. You're in a <laughs> false reality. And I'm from outside the reality telling you it's doesn't it, this isn't it and so of course if you take that in that's going to be unbelievably chaotic and as the movies show of course there's a tr there's a tremendous push by the whole system to shut those people up 
And mm-hmm. that's kind of the story of our real spiritual history. The ones that might have been or, or connected to outside the bubble have had a lot of work put on them to shut them up. Oh, yeah. They yeah. will try. They've been trying to shut us up for a long time, Howdy. Like we had like 100 <laughs> subscribers and they're trying to remove our subscribers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I just I, I like that you're there and you're doing this and you're, you're, you're sharing this information. You're not afraid to share it. And uh, I think that's one of the most important parts of the puzzle is that as I've started to learn from having actually done the book and talk about it now is that there are so many people out there who feel they felt this for a long time. They have felt these kind of truths within them for a long time, but there's been no external thing. There's been no book. There's been no videos. There's nothing that clarifies it. So they've kind of felt really alone. And now as this stuff is, is beginning to almost be like a zeitgeist, it's kind of starting to, to yes. be, and I think because of the, of, the, of the two years that we're in, because of the insanity, these things are starting to bubble up because people are open for different explanations as to how this place can be so insane. And as this thing bubbles up, as more people are sharing it, all of these people can say, finally, somebody, I finally, I'm not crazy. Okay, somebody else is saying the same thing I've been thinking for 20 years. Okay. And they kind of get, I, I get almost the, the sense of unbelievable relaxation in their emails. Like, yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm not crazy. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We've also seen though, on the contrary of the, you know, the love and light community in this, ex, like the car- reincarnation trap community, a lot of anger, <laughs> tons of anger. And yeah. I guess staying like in the victimized state of like, well, all you know, this is happening to me and you know, blaming everything on the matrix which okay i get to a certain degree but then it's like well what can you do now what would you say to them Mm. you know as a writer of this work yeah really good example is i got uh, like i got an email a few days ago but well do you mean then like if, if if what you say is true then why shouldn't i just kill myself and get out of here and I'm like, actually, I actually had to go back because we're just getting ready to get the print book out. I've just, the, the PDF ebook's been out first. I'm just getting ready to put the print book out. And I'm like, yeah, I really need to address that early on in the book. So that mm. doesn't, and that's, that, that's exactly not what I would suggest to people to do because what you have to sort of take this in is once you begin getting this possibility, and again, that's all we're talking about. It's a possibility. We're not saying it's true. We can't 100% mm-hmm. prove it. We can bring a lot of experience from our lives. Like, I mean, literally, I could sit here for an hour and give you personal experiences that validate this, this theory uh, that I come up with. You might say the thesis that's here. But we then have to take that knowledge and re- that realization of, okay, this is not where I want to be. This is not the realm I want to be in. This is not something I want to continue doing, but I'm here now. And so by being here now, we want to use it to have be as prepared as possible so that when the exit door opens, whatever that's going to be for us, whether it's still alive or in the after death state, we're ready. And so if my feeling is if, if you check out of here too quickly, then you might be missing preparation, right? There's nothing to learn. I'm not saying you need to learn anything or to school. We, we can talk all about that in the memory wipe mm-hmm. and how that's obviously not true, but you're, you're, you're preparing and you're preparing your deepest being and you're, you're looking for more and more deceptions, more and more tricks so that you're ready to let those tricks, those deceptions can't get you. It's learning things like the Apocryphon of John in the, um, in the Nag Hammadi text or the, uh, or, or the, uh, part end part of the weighing of the heart in the book of the dead where there's this question and answer between what you might call gatekeepers and the newly deceased getting this idea okay i'm going to get i might get questioned on a whole lot of stuff do i know what the questions are going to be and am i prepared for those answers because if you're not once again you're going to get tricked and recycled into this thing again so uh, my answer to that is you want you want as much time as you possibly can to be as prepared as you possibly can to strengthen your intention as deeply as possible so that if your wish is to say i'm done with all of these experiences in this false simulated realm that you have what you need to truly end it so don't don't waste your opportunity, no matter how no matter how hard it is, no matter how much the suffering is. And I, I get, I mean, I've had a lot of trauma. People have had way more trauma than me, way more. And it's like, you guys know, I bumped into several of them and it's like, wow. But even with that, it's like, can you use it? Even as painful as it is, can you use it to your advantage so that you never have to be in a life and experience it again? 
Mm. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That's always been my motivation for, for healing, for freeing myself from the trauma that has happened to me is I never want to do this again. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that doesn't happen. So if that means, you know, focusing on, on healing myself, releasing, clearing all of those things, then my life is going to be dedicated to that and preparing Mm. for death and, and how to ultimately be free from this system. Yeah. Yeah. Do you um want to talk about a few of your personal experiences that you sure. had? kind of experiences would you like to hear about? Well, that have led you, um, like you said, you've experienced some trauma that have led you to in into uh, a deeper understanding of this realm and where we are and what's happening here, and I guess some of the suffering that you've endured. Sure, we can. I can give two really old ones as a way of kind of getting us into the start of it, and then we can maybe get into some death experiences as well. On top of that, because I've had yeah. a few, well, they're kind of like near death experiences, but not exactly. Um, so I was come when I was coming out of university, and my fa- my father had stolen all my money. I grew up with a with a psychopath, actually, mm-hmm. and so I, I'd ha- I I was in this sort of sinking process. I had been an extremely happy, creative, um, sort of, I guess, uh, life of the party kind of person up till that point in my life when this experience sort of, um, I guess, if you talk about it in sort of this neo-shamanic terms where like a piece of the soul was was taken away at that point and 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 just a, a, a depression and a difficulty was kind of just cruising through my life. Okay, so this depression is cruising through my life and I made it back to university. I did get my degree. It was a difficult chore, but I did it. I completed it. And uh, but within three months after that, my uh, at that time ex girlfriend was murdered. And once that experience hit me, there was like a it was like the first major shift in my seeing of reality. And that was we had you know all of us had been told there's a there's a step by step feature to life. You go to school, you go to university, you work hard, you get good grades, you you get yourself a good job, you get married, you have kids, you do this, you do, and you kind of just, and everything will work out and be a nice person. And, and here I am, I've now just seen one of the brightest people in Canada at the time, like literally she was like, I don't know, I can't remember what the highest scholarship thing you can get in the country, that that was her, you know, and extremely bright, extremely pleasant. Uh, just she was like living the perfect experience that you were told this is how you live and now she's dead and I had to step back at that point and say that obviously that story I've been told and everybody else is being told of how to live is wrong it's quite obvious it's wrong because if it was right she wouldn't be dead so okay that sent me on quite a couple of years of digging into then what is the what call what's the right way to live then because if the whole universe is sending out one way, well, what's that way? During this process, while this is going on, I was living in Toronto at the time. And I was, for some reason, I was a downtown subway stop at eight o'clock in the morning. I don't know what I was doing there. And the train doors open. It was like near Bay Street where all the executives are. And everybody came off the subway train and they looked like cattle going to get slaughtered to me. That's oh exactly God, was the I've look in the right. Just, just total, they, they, they're just dying. And I remember saying to myself, I'm never doing that. I don't care what life I live. I'm not going to be picking this and losing, you know, it took a long time for me to break out of and find a life that was right for me. But these were the first two things that kind of pushed into my head. You know, this is what life is supposed to be. And here I was saying, seeing one way or another that no and I'm, it's probably why it pushed me into being a comedian because once you start once you take up a life as a stand-up comedian <laughs> you don't you don't function like a normal person right your mind doesn't function like a normal person you're already on kind of on the outskirts of society as you kind of look at the world differently so all of those things together were building up the initial stages of moving in I still wasn't in a spiritual life but I was at least I was breaking from the old life at that point of of what life is supposed to be Wow. That's really profound. Really profound. 
So mm -hmm. you mentioned that you've had a few death experiences. Do you want mm -hmm. to talk about those? Sure. Let's talk. This will be one where I think the first one you guys can really discuss and, and share and go into. And then I thought, <clears throat> I should not, well, I'll, when we get to the second one, I have a completely different idea for you of what we could do with it. But um, because I, I just, I have a very good connection with both of you. So we can maybe do something in a little different way. But the first one happened when uh, it was 1999. I'm living in Calgary in Canada at this point. And uh, I had just been to a, and I've been like one year into my, ancient Egyptian work. One year into my study, I was, the book was coming along. I just started to meet some medicine people. So my, my you know, that, that experience was starting to sh shape up. And um, I, I went on a, a bachelor auction date. So it was for breast cancer research. So you can't say no, of course. And it's a, it's a, it's a scary experience, actually. Um, and very few people have done it, but to actually be standing on the stage and, you know, uh, being bid on is actually quite scary, but the point was, yeah. <laughs> so went on the date with the woman and she turned out to be an alcoholic and all of her experiences were about drinking and, and how drunk she was and how she woke up in another person's house. And at this point I was still drinking and it was actually in one sense, that was the experience that ended, that turned me to stop drinking at that point. Uh, within days I had chosen to stop drinking and I've been like 20 some years now uh, without it. But the important part of it was somewhere in the course of the night, she asked me a question. Why are you doing all this spiritual work anyway? It sounds really stupid and a big waste of time. And I didn't really answer anything because I'm kind of like supposed to be entertaining her, right? Mm -hmm. But the next day I'm walking on the street and uh, the question popped up in my head again. It was like one o'clock in the afternoon. It popped up in my head. And then and this time I gave an answer. And the answer was because if I didn't, I would be dead now. And at that moment, the, the place I was walking just went away. It was gone. And I was looking at a different scene. I was on a, I was on a roadway. And I found out later from my own journey work that it was a roadway in, in, um, in the southern Ontario. And there was a roadway there. And there was been a car crash. There was a large truck that had crashed with a smaller car. And I could look inside the car. And there was a woman inside. And she looked pretty crumpled. But she was you know, she was alive, but she was in rough shape. There was a, the truck driver was kind of walking around kind of dazed, not knowing what to do. And then I noticed there was a third car in the ditch that it turned over on its side. And I kind of like, I guess, floated over, you might say to it. And I was just curious, how's this driver? And I looked inside and I realized, oh, this driver's dead. Well, actually the driver's me. Whoa. And I realized at that moment, I had probably tapped into uh, a death in a parallel reality. And it was at that moment when I realized all these things I've been hearing about multiple me's, multiple realities, you know, it's not just this one life, I've got a million of me. And I was like, oh, this makes complete sense at this exact moment. This is when I died in this other reality and maybe other realities similarly. And so right from then, from that moment, I had this experience of now I'm going to start checking how can I prove the possibility of more than one reality? And so that took a, that took a six month uh, work just from that one experience as, as an example of where an experience can take you when that happens and so now I'm 100% convinced there's there are a million of me some of me are much nicer some of them are much worse some of them are much happier some of them are much more sad uh, and I also know I also know that everything I didn't do in this life I did in another life and everything I you know it, it's kind of like it, it's actually all evened out which would make more sense if you're in a realm of experience you would want 10 billion persons having the experience, not just one. So there's, there's one death experience. Wow. What do you think happens to all our aspects if we are able to free ourselves from this? Like, is part of us still here? Because they all are on their own individual journeys? Or do they kind of come with us like a Russian doll? <laughs> like... I have thought about that, Karen, mm -hmm. so many times. It was like, if one life, if I've got a million lives and one of them actually figures all this out and exits, do all the, like, is it a million souls of me that are all yeah. somewhat connected as one and they all go? Or is it just that one? Literally, there've been a million, the, my, what I think of as my essence has been branched off into Splits, a million and yeah. there's a million individual pieces that have to go. I don't know. But in a, in a story by Ken Grimwood called Replay, which was the original Groundhog Day. In this one, the guy is reliving his entire life, not just a day. 
And in one of the lives, the woman that he's got to become friends with, who's also realizing this replaying of their existence, uh, he goes to meet her just after he's returned to the, the next life, his, his new life and his old body. And she doesn't know who he is. She's like literally like unknowing. And he's like, oh, wow. Kind of like, did she get it in the last life? And she's literally left. And now all that's left is like, it's an empty shell. It's just like a robot that's just walking around now that just, mm -hmm. that's populating the world. And then he, then he got this thought. And this is a thought I've had too, that, you know, we, we look at other people. This is a great way to break down some self-importance. We like to think I'm on a spiritual path. I've done all this work. I'm, I'm ahead of all of the masses. The masses are so below me because they don't know what I know. But what if all of these ones I think are below me got it in some other life a long time ago, their essence is already left. They're literally just now non-player characters to fill in the game, but only because they figure, I'm like, I'm not the first to figure it out. I'm like the last one. I'm like the last on the <laughs> chain. And, and yeah, and it's, so it's like, <laughs> that also just shook my a bit of my self importance of like yeah maybe I'm not as important especially I think as I'm just I'm really late to the game so to answer your question I don't know because I think like you we have come to see so often particularly now it's more profound in the last two years there are a lot of people that are not really people walking around they are they're they're not just robotic from the standpoint of they are oh locked into an idea and a system they only I mean like literally they're robots. Yeah. They're literally robots walking around. And it's like, well, how many humans are actually here? How many actual, what we would call true soulful humans exist? I'm now starting to think, wow, maybe a hundred million, maybe less. I, I don't know, actually, because now There's it's definitely really three here. Go, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's way less than I would, would have ever thought. I, I, and, and yeah, is it just, has it been set up that way or is it? Something's happened and souls have left, souls have come in. I don't know. Interesting thoughts. Yeah. 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 This is my life. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> no, I love it. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and everyone's just kind of looking around like, like they're like, you're looking at them like, when are you going to wake up? And they're looking at you like, I woke I'm up gone. a long time ago. I'm like, I'm gone. I'm out of here. Yeah, I'm, done. I'm, done. I'm a robot. I don't even know what you're thinking. Yeah. So there's one. I'll give you another experience you guys can play with and see where this takes you into your world. But so after I've had these experiences and before I had my, my main death experience, I, I worked really, really hard. I was obsessed. I was putting in 10, 12 hour days of exercises. You know, I, I recap, recapitulated my entire life. Mm -hmm. Took me four and a half years. Uh, I was doing, if there was a practice that came to me, I did it and took it seriously. And in the course of this, one of the practices I was doing, this is around 2002 now, by this point, I was testing reality from the standpoint of this idea that how much of reality is coming from my mind, how much of my thoughts are not just influencing it, I mean, literally making reality. So I began doing exercises to stop my mind stop the thought, not to be happy or not to be peaceful. I was going to see if I stop my mind long enough, what's going to happen to the external world. And in the course of this, things began to just become bizarre in the external world. And it got to a point where one day I was sitting with my then girlfriend at the time. And uh, I told her, oh, your sister's coming over. What do you mean? Well, she, she's outside. She's parking. She's coming over. And I saw her park her car and she walks up the stairs and all of a sudden there's a knock on the door. My girlfriend's just staring at me like I'm, you know, like I'm insane. She goes over, opens the door, lets her in. And then she says, how do you know she was coming over? So she, she just, look, she just parked her car and she walked up. Like, Howdy, that's a wall. What? It's like there was no wall there. The wall just didn't exist. I was just literally seeing outside. And it was only when she told me there's supposed to be a wall there that I kind of went, oh, yeah. And for a while, it was actually getting to the point where I had to hold on to chairs when I sat down because I wasn't sure the chair was still going to be there when I sat down. Like it was literally uh, like all these glitches. Yeah, all of reality was just just <laughs> it was just so, uh, so translucent that it's not just it would become see through it literally would just appear and disappear, or change wow. or become something else or. So when I realized that's how I realized well life is not when they say life is a dream, I mean, they really mean it because it's literally, it's only here because my thoughts keep telling me table, keep telling me chair, keep telling me person, keep telling me whatever. And if I could stop that reality, just 
changes and goes away. That doesn't mean it's any better. It was actually really scary. I actually got scared for a while. And it yeah. took, uh, it took the, the, my, it took my Korean monk actually to give me the, the help I needed to just turn out of that. He just told, I, I sent him a message. <laughs> I'll tell you, so then you can talk and I'll shut up. He, I sent him a, because he, he was living in Hawaii at that time. And so I said, he doesn't speak any English, but I sent a message to uh, the people who were with him, told him what was going on. And the response I got back, oh yeah, we talked to Mr. Park and he thought it was very funny. He thinks you're going crazy. Um, <laughs> he thinks you should just, yeah, he thinks you should just go and play golf for a couple of days and just focus on that and uh, let us know how you are. And so the first response I got was, yeah, first response was, okay, he thinks I'm going crazy, but it's no big deal because he thinks it's funny. Okay. And then he said, so like, just go golf. So idea, like, don't think about it for a couple of days. So I did that. And all of a sudden reality got to be much more solid yeah. Uh, again. Yeah. <laughs> but I always know that I, I know if I want to, I can go back to doing those, those exercises again. And I know reality would just would fall apart. Wow. How long did that last for you? On, on a minor scale, it was probably over a two month gradient period, getting more and more and more and more. And then once it sort of hit the pinnacle, it was about uh, two weeks where I was in this kind of, yeah. I, I remember one time I went for a walk and I, uh, and I came back to my girlfriend's house because she, she lived near, this, near the uh, river in Calgary that I'd like to walk on. And I came back to the house and it's like all the trees look different. All the houses look different. Everything did not look like now, of course, I never had understood like an idea of Mandela effect or have I actually entered a parallel reality necessarily. I was just, mm -hmm. I walked in and the first thing I asked her is, can I ask you a question? What year is it? Like, and, and she could have told me any year and I would have gone, yeah, I guess that's what it is. I've been gone a long time. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was like, that's just how it was. So again, when I read, when I hear other stories or stories, the medicine men have told me that there's one I'll tell you because with a, with a a show title like quantum healing uh, i'll have to tell you this medicine man story but a lot of the stories that medicine men told me began to make much more sense of of this reality so i'll i'll see what you guys want to say about that but I, then I'll, I'll give you another story no i i just think it's fascinating and i'm interested totally. in like what were the kind of exercises you were using to do something like that mm. let me just write down this story so i don't forget it I'm terrible. That's one thing I can be terrible at. I start talking and then I forget the story. Um, at that time, I was, um, one of the things I was doing specifically then was I had been reading the books of Carlos Castaneda. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the Korean monk had done a lot of work with me, mostly through um, what he, through cupping was his main practice, uh, which many who, who know acupuncture and, and whatever know that practice. But uh, a normal uh, cupping uh, uh, would be done with two or three cups, right? Mr. Park would use like 80. 80? And, and, and your, yeah, your body would be, your body would just be a black and blue uh, mess. Oh and my God. he did it with me for 60 straight days. Mm. Um, and he would get to the point where he would say things like, like you just point to different circles, right? And he's like, oh, you here, why are you so angry? Oh, you. And I remember one time he just, he looked at, he looked at one and he's like, oh, you, why do you drink so much? You're going to get liver cancer and die. And he's walked yeah. out of the room. What? Okay. Liver cancer and die. You know, but he was able to read the colors of the various cups and the, and the, and the, and whatever to know all the things that were going on inside of your body, inside of your energy field. And his point was, once you got to clean, once the, once they became clean, all of the poisons and toxins were out of your body. So I was doing this kind of, and it was painful as hell while we were doing it, but then it would move on. But then there would always be these, these various discussions about life or about ideas or about concepts that I knew were related to the cupping. And he used to tell us that again, because he, we didn't really speak Korean. So we, we had trouble fully getting things he would try to say, but he, he told us that what the, what the real healing is about is first is what he called the sun or Kwang. And that was to heal the darkness of your heart. So the first thing you do is cl clear the darkness. Once you clear the darkness, the next thing to learn was Myung or the moon. And that was to learn how to reflect. And we thought that was then how to not take the dream in fully was how, how to reflect what the dream was attempting to do and control us and reflect it out. Mm. 
Then the third part, which he never really talked about much, because I don't think he think, thought any of us were going to get there, but it was the complete cleansing and transformation of the DNA. And that a lot of the work, even at that time with the cupping, was doing that. It was healing. It was changing the entire structure of the genetic code within us. We didn't understand how he was doing it, but we began to understand that's what he was doing. And, um, and another of his practices, I'll get into my practices but for Mr. Parks. One of the ones we did uh, with someone when I was visiting him in Hawaii is we would be a group of like six or seven of us sitting in the front room and we'd go one by one into the bedroom and we'd lay down then face down naked on the bed. And he would take a wooden rice spoon and start smacking our back with the rice spoon. And normally it would just be like this, like nothing. No problem. And then every, every once in a while, be, ah, what did he just do? Well, how hard did he hit me? And the other person that's there is like, he just hit you the same as every other time. So after a while, we finally started asking, what are you doing? Oh, and sorry. And we were supposed to laugh while he was, while he was hitting us, we were supposed to laugh really deep belly laughter. So as if the idea is every time pain comes, you're, you're responding to it with laughter. You're responding to it with, with any challenge. It's, it's funny. You're laughing. So we finally asked him, what are you doing with the rice spoon? And the answer we got was, oh, I'm hitting the serpent. The what? Mm. The serpent? He said, yeah, there's two serpents in all of us. People know about the Kundalini one, the one that goes up to the sky, but there's another one that's pulling us down back into the earth. I'm hitting that one. <laughs> okay. Wow. So I got that information and then I'm laying there a few days later. And again, he's banging with the rice spoon and he hits me up here on the shoulder, really hard, bang. And I feel this thing wiggle through my arm, like literally just wiggling through my arm. Like, and you're right. like, ha ha ha. He's, he's, he's not giving me a metaphor. There's like, there's this serpent yeah, thing it. inside of me wow. that, and he's hitting it and he's weakening yeah. it. And it's like, holy shit. So it's, it, so you know, how do I, when you're asking earlier, how do I get to a place where I can write a book like I'm writing now about the, the nature of reality? It's things like that from so long ago that I didn't understand were going on. We're all a part of this journey was learning all of these really deep, weird, dark, strange pieces of experience that began to shape understanding of kind of like, okay, I can kind of now place this into a, a presentation but it's been a long time trying to understand all this stuff because as you can tell it's 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 kind of weird it's kind of weird yeah. <laughs> it is. no I think it's but amazing so cool um and it just briefly on the two snakes we've seen that in sessions too so that's validating for right. us on what we've seen yeah, yeah you, we just yeah. did a session on Tina just the other day and she saw two snakes too yeah yeah yeah, it's interesting. So like, yeah, and like I say, it, but I got the, it was one thing to kind of believe him. It was another thing to get the confirmation of feeling it, yes. feeling it in the body when, oh, oh crap, he's, he's not making this up, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then the other thing that the thing that we used to hate him for, I mean, he's like, <laughs> I can give you story after story from Mr. Park, but he used to always tell us don't have sex. And of course, this used to really upset us because we're like, you know, well, we, we, we want to have spirituality where we have all this, you know, we can have sex. It's like, oh, no, it's not because it's bad or anything. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just you don't know how to do it. You're just wasting all of your energy. So at this point, it's, it's you just so just don't until you know what you're <laughs> doing. Then you can do as much as you want. And it kind of, again, it started to make sense of like, yeah, I guess we don't know what we're doing. And we don't right. really understand it from an energetic standpoint of what's actually happening to the energy and the experience. And so it's another one of these things that over years has taken time to really contemplate and really go through of like, what was he hinting at? What was he, what was the, what was the underlying message there? Yeah. 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 Totally. There's yeah. a lot that goes on that we don't see. Yeah. So I'll take you to the medicine man story because you'll like this one then and you can play with this story. <laughs> so this was again, this was the Ojibwe medicine man and, and he told me that there were these and, and he's a medicine man now, right? He's, he's like, when people are sick, they go to him. So he's a highly respected medicine man. And he said, well, there are actually some elders, he called them elders, who kind of are the elders of the whole Ojibwe nation. They're not just like on my reserve, they're for the whole nation. And we kind of don't really ever meet them and we don't ever talk to them. And it was like this discussion point of like, should I ever meet them even someday? And, and he said, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, so somebody, some woman from uh, Winnipeg, I guess, had come to the reserve because she was doing a thesis paper on native Indian healing. 
And for some reason, they decided to take her to some of these true elders. And the elder said to her, okay, if you're going to actually write this, there's some things we have to show you so that you understand what we do when it comes to healing. You can never talk about this. You can never write about it. You can never share this with anybody, but you need to do, you need to see this. So they showed her something. Of course, she wrote about it in her thesis. The day she went to hand it in, the thesis pages were all blank. Everything that was on her computer was had disappeared. Literally every piece of scrap of information she had on writing this thesis was gone. Wow. And that was like, wow, that's another, <laughs> we just don't know what, what this reality is and what we can do or not do here. It's just like, wow. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. so many things like that, that happen all the time that Karen and I have just kind of started taking for granted because it's just become like a normal part of our lives now, you know, like we don't even think twice about these things, but um do you want to share about your second NDE that you had? Um, and then maybe we can talk about some solutions for how to prepare yeah. for death and exit. Yeah, I also thought as we were as we were going through this that it also could be interesting to have to share the experience uh, potentially as well in like a session format where you guys then actually fine because there's layers of this experience I don't know I haven't mm. seen and so I know that there could be so much more information that would be not just for me and my own life but journey than for other people um, that could be hidden in this so I thought that could also be something really interesting for others at some point in time and potentially valuable for me right yeah um, so the it, yeah the experience itself simplified and then we can go into various detail as needed but um I went walking with a friend in 2004 and I was going to take him to an area of the Canmore mountains known as Egypt Lake, because there's a really strange part of the, of Canmore mountains of that are all Egyptian name, right? Pharaoh Lake, uh, Egyptian Lake, Pharaoh mountain. Uh, it, it's mm -hmm. like, it's an obvious ancient Egyptian place, but we couldn't get there. So because we couldn't get there, it was snowed in still at the time, we decided to go hike Johnson Canyon, which is one of Canada's most famous waterfalls. I didn't know about it. I'd never been there, but let's go there. And we walked instead of up the, normally you park and just walk up the falls. We walked way into the forest and got to it on the backside. And as we got there, we got to just like a stream. And I thought, oh, this is a good place to sit down and meditate. Not really understanding what we're what we're up against, so we just went down, sat down, and meditated. We were sitting peacefully, and all of a sudden, I decided I'm gonna I'm gonna wash. I had a crystal in my pocket. I'm gonna wash my crystal in the water and cleanse it. And as I went to cleanse it, my foot slipped on the wet rock, and I was in the water. And I had no idea that the speed of the water was just was just unbelievably powerful. Okay. Um, and I quickly realized it's powerful because the waterfall is like right there. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like sitting right at the top of where this waterfall is. So I swam as hard as I could to get back to the shore to my friend who was trying to, you know, get his hand out to help me pull me out. And I, I again, he wound up slipping on the rock and he came in too. Oh, geez. And at that point, I was now not flat. I was upright like this and the water just hammered me now back into the, into the smoke, into the current. And I realized at that second, like, Oh, this is where I'm going to die. How interesting. Who would have thought? It was this, it was, it was an incredible knowing of like, this is, I'm dying now. This is, this is it. And what was also great was at the time was there was no need to, I really want to keep living. Oh, I wish there's more I need to do. It was just, yeah, I'm going to die and I'm going to get front row seats to watch it. And I found it kind of funny that of all the ways you could die, this is how it was going to be for me slipping into the water and being a fool and falling <laughs> over a canyon. That was going to be my, my de the death. As soon as I had come though to that realization that I'm dying and it's okay, there was all of a sudden, everything I could classify as me was gone. So thought was gone. Memory was gone. Experiences were gone. Fears were gone. Hopes were gone. It was literally everything was gone. And there was just this witnessing awareness uh, is the best way I can describe it in the witnessing awareness would come 
and I call them clusters of information because they weren't thoughts. They would literally be like a giant cluster and then it'd go boof and then it would go, the next thing, boof, and it would go, and it was just like, that's how I was experiencing what was going on. It was in these giant clusters of information. So they would just come and they would burst. Then, and this is all happening in like a microsecond, right? It's all happening in like one second. Then I got what I could classify as like a, a, a computer download is the best way I can describe it. Like a stick was placed into my brain and there was this massive download of information just got put into me. And I guess a part of the last 15, 20 years since that has been trying to like look through the computer of my mind at what's in this file, what's in this file. It's kind of what it was like. So I went through that experience. In the course of all this was the realization that, oh yeah, all of the things I ever thought I was are false. That's not, all of it's a lie. Everything I've ever thought of as me is the lie. I don't exist. I don't actually exist because here I am in the, in the moment struggle of life and death, and they're all gone. None of them are here to help me. There's just an awareness watching it. So I re, so I had done all this work, like I told you about seeing that reality was not true, but I was still, I was still real, right? Me, this thing here, the reality is fake, but I'm real. So this experience was like, oh yeah, I'm not real too right. How, how did I not see that? You know, it's, like, it's almost like what it was. How did I not? Yeah. How did I miss that? Like, of course. And I'm so, not real too. <laughs> and yeah, your friend, meanwhile, was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I, what happened at that point was now I kind of turned slightly. So I was moving very close to the waterfall and I turned slightly to see him and he was dog paddling in place where he was. He was in, I guess, a place of a little less current. So he wasn't being okay. pushed. And the first time a thought came to my mind, this is the first thought I had. It was, if I don't get out, how is he going to get out? And I, at that point, my leg slammed into an underwater boulder, really hurt my leg badly, but it veered me off course a little bit, enough for me to realize it must be shallow enough for there to be rocks here. So I kind of dug in with my feet and my hands and I kind of crawled my way out. And as I was crawling out, I remember screaming to him, it's shallow, you can crawl out, it's shallow. And I'm thinking about I'm going to go get a tree branch or something to you know to put in the water and as I turn he's walking out too and then we sat down for about 30 or 40 minutes exactly where we we had fell in and we just sat there absolutely quiet totally reserved just just sat there mm. and then we started sharing our experience and his experience was very similar to mine and we shared back and forth for a good hour or, or two, our, our experiences. And of course, fear is now gone. Like it just, you know, the idea of like, wouldn't you move to another location? It's like, no. And we, one of the things we talked about, even at that early stage was how perfect it was. Not just the, not just the getting out, the falling in was perfect. The getting out was perfect. Everything was like perfectly designed. It was like, there was nothing of this entire experience that was in any way accidental. It was like a perfect, perfectly made experience. Mm -hmm. And we left, we left and we walked back to the car and it was great having him because then for the next while we could sit and have coffee together and because we both were going through similar problems. So the first month or two, there was no problem at all. It was just clarity. It was unbelievable uh, clearness about everything. A lot of the things I wrote in Falling for Truth actually came in this in this two weeks or month of, of extreme clarity. Um, but then I made two errors, and I'm going to share the errors with you and with everyone else. The first error was I was pulled into the world far too quickly, and I didn't get enough time to integrate the experience, to sit there and be still with it and, and understand what had happened. I was literally, I allowed myself to be dragged into the world, and that that place of understanding was lost yeah. the second thing was a was a weird egoic trick that got played and the egoic trick that got played was if you think of your computer screen like now as the as the totality of everything i got like a flash of light on a corner of the screen so one flash illuminated that part of of uh, the of the dream and reality completely but because it's holographic you kind of got a flash of the whole screen so you got a bit of the whole knowledge but the trick was the way i got tricked is oh i like i think i know i know everything now i've seen everything i know it all when actually i really only know this little this little piece and i wound up getting tricked in the belief that there's nothing more i have to do I've already completed it all. I've reached the state of absolute and oneness and, and totality, which is now I see a valuable 
point on the journey, but it's just a point. There's much more you have to do to go forward with it. But this, the way the experience played out for me was a trick. And then in the trick, as I got more and more, you might say, believing this idea now of myself, that's when the illnesses started. And Mm -hmm. I've gone through 15 years of continuous illnesses, similar ones, but they'll just change. I've seen 50 or 60 healers. I've seen some of the best people I've tried. I've got 60 different, um, um, uh, not recommendations, 60 different uh, diagnosis, 60 different treatments. None of them have ever worked. It just at a certain point of time, whatever that illness is, just stops and nothing happens for a while. Then something else comes up. And again, it's like, literally, it's not on my timeline. I've learned how to manage them all. I've learned, I've learned the experience of what to do when they're around, but like literally no one has truly been able to figure out exactly what they're linked to. Mm -hmm. And I know, of course, they're linked to something from the experience and something false about myself or the experience that I'm still holding on to that, that is pushing down into the material that is kind of saying, you're missing it. You're missing it. You're missing it. It's like a giant message over and over and over again. So I, while I've had this wonderful uh, breakthroughs from the experience, I also feel now looking back on it, there's also been a sense of manipulation from the experience because the things I'm writing about and talking about now in this book are the things I was working on just before this death experience happened. And by being pushed so deeply into the ideas of oneness and and uh, and the absolute reality, I put a lot of this stuff aside, even though I still talked about parasitic entities and things, I, I downplayed it tremendously and focused on this other part, which I see was had value, but was like, I was being manipulated at the same time and my life was being manipulated during this period. And it's only now in the last two or three years, I've kind of come out of a lot of the, the deception that was around the experience and I'm kind of still working on it. So there's the kind of, semi overview of it um yeah that's like what you know where, where it's come about the pendulum swinging one way and going to the other and what we where we really need to be is right in the middle in the balance space right yeah so you feel like you were being manipulated to focus more mm-hmm. on oneness and those kinds of concepts yeah and to and to uh, focus on like i say and to get really focused on the world really quickly to really focus on a lot of things that uh were going to just start spinning the wheels automatically um but the problem again is the is the egoic structure right i i, I mm-hmm. at the time i thought my ego was dead because in the canyon it was mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. in the say first month or two it was it was gone but what I was calling dead was just a very weakened and shattered ego. It was restructuring itself. It was taking its time and figuring out a new way to build itself. And when it came back, I wasn't ready for it. So I had, I had now I had no control at times over what was going on. So some really weird things started to happen. I would have this wonderful intention or this really good thing I wanted to do, but it would hit the new weird egoic structure and it would come out quite messy. So I went through a period of real difficulty as well, just because, and I actually stopped for a number of years around 2011 or so. I stopped doing any talks, any lectures. I stopped doing any writing. I literally took three years or so and stopped. And it was only after I I got married in 2014, I think, right right around that time, that I started feeling I can slowly get back into this now, that the Mm -hmm. time away from this is, is, has served some of its purpose, but it's been a slow process to even get to the point where I'm back to doing the kind of things I'm doing here. But now I feel so much more clear with what I say, so much more balanced, so much more uh, that I can present, I can present things and not be finding ways to make anything about myself. That it's oh, it's it's well before there were ways of. There's always something about me in the presentation. That's kind of been a lot, not fully obviously, but a lot of it's been dropped. So it's also been this giant twenty-year experience, which, in one way, has been useful. It's taught me a tremendous amount, but. but I, I kind of wished I could have done like some of the others where you just need a year or two and it's all done. And then you're, you can move on from there. I've had the 15, 20 year. <laughs> the long version. road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. So that's quite an experience. Um, yeah. Yeah. Are you still yeah. experiencing the illnesses? 
Do they, are they still oh, yeah. popping up? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, they'll keep, they'll keep cycling, circling in some new things, some old things. They'll just, um, what kind of experiences uh, do you have? These, hmm? How many? What kind of like experiences or, um, symptoms do you experience? Oh, wow. They, they started, they mainly start with, uh, uh, some sort of stomach issue. So the stomach becomes very, it becomes very difficult to digest. And then the, then the intestinal tract doesn't work very well. And then you'll get the pain from that. And then, then you'll start, then I started dealing with bizarre, like asthma, like symptoms that happened after like a bout of bronchitis. And, but that then links into like a type of acid reflux that can come. And so then you never know, is it an asthma, an acid reflux? Uh, then there'll be weird uh, periods of dehydration where there's no reason why I should be dehydrated and I'll get dehydrated. Mm -hmm. Uh, my triple warmer can sometimes just explode and I have to do like really hard work on the triple warmer just to move that energy out of my head. So otherwise the tinnitus will start to come up and uh, there can be, uh, yeah, there can be eye issues where for a while you just you don't see properly and then, and, but they just, then they'll just go away. So it's like, it's been all, yeah, you've got, there's at times there've been kidneys, at times there've been bladder. I've, I've had knee injuries. It's just, it's, Nothing that like I ever need to, I would ever need to go to a doctor. I would ever need to be hospitalized for. It's just stuff that is like a giant frustrating annoyance. Yeah. 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 I definitely feel Which like I'm it. sure you've, you, you, you recognize somewhere in all of your practices. Yeah. This, this experience. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I definitely and, think, and I, a, I think a session oh, would be, would be really helpful for you. Yeah, a big thing happened to me and the change happened was I met a healer here in Norway. Mm. One of the best I've ever come across. Real healer, like a, like a, a truly a real one. Uh, who, someone, you know, no, no business, no website. You would never know about this person if someone didn't tell you about him. And he found a, paras a type of, I don't call it a parasitic entity. I'm going to call it a, a projected thought form that had been in my energy field for well over 25 years and when he described it I knew exactly what he was talking about and I could describe it back to him even though you know when that was removed he removed that in early 2020 all of a sudden I went from having a YouTube channel with 100 people and nobody buying my books to just a, a giant change overnight so I knew okay that's a big piece of what's been happening for 20 years but that's just a piece there's yeah. more there and it's like, what else is going on? And it's another reminder that we don't like to hear about parasitic entities. We don't like to hear about demonic beings that latch into us from an early age. But unfortunately, that is part of this realm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember having that realization for myself. It's not an easy thing to come to terms with, but it is the truth of this realm. It's just the way it works here you know, and they're really nothing to be afraid of. They can only have power over us when they hide in the darkness. You know, once you shine the light on them and actually release those entities from you, you see how your world opens up. Like for you to go from a hundred subscribers to, you know, I don't know how many you have now, but there's a lot. A lot. Oh, a lot, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of attention <laughs> on you. People were like excited for this interview and things like that. So your name is definitely floating around out there. Um yeah. You and, said you, by the way, you said you had, so sorry, you said you had some questions too. I don't want to forget those that there might be yes. on a list from subscribers. So I'm just, I'm not cutting you off. I'm just throw again, uh, if I don't say it, I'll forget it. No, okay. It's so no, it's good. Cause I know we only have a few minutes, but, um, well, we can, I wanted, well, we can go a bit longer. Okay. We can see what comes up. So, okay. So I wanted to ask you about recapitulation and mm. first of all if we could explain to people what exactly that is and then I have some questions around it from our group okay recapitulation is an idea that I first got from uh, Castaneda but then found in various other uh, ancient sources and you can call it a, it's a life review it's going through every second of your life to see it clearly and honestly. Um, when you start doing a life review, um, one of the things that happens is you feel, oh, I know my life. I, I know what happened to me. But if you start doing this process, honestly, you begin to see that all they are is beliefs and ideas. And in fact, 
false ideas that you've generated about the events of your past that that's not the truth. So it's designed to really see the truth of your life um, and see it from an energetic standpoint and see it from a feeling standpoint, not from a what happened on a mechanical world or the, the, the necessarily ABC. It's what did I feel? What was going on inside of me when these experiences mm-hmm. were going on? Uh, it's done by it's done by creating a, a list and working your way backwards from the person you recently met to mom and dad. Uh, it, has, it has the purpose of restructuring your energy in this realm, seeing the truth of what you've lived. And now I see also more importantly, it it is preparing you for the after death life review. That if you don't know your life completely here, and if there are holes where you can be tricked, then I guarantee you when the beings on the other side bring up your, your life experience, they're going to know what to trick you with and you have to be one step ahead of them. So all of these things are part of what you might call a life review. The one thing to, to mention, though, is Castaneda talked about two types of people. He talked about what are known as stalkers and what are called dreamers. Stalkers work more with the world, their mind and, and, and material, material reality. Dreamers work more in altered states of consciousness. Those who are dreamers don't need to do the recapitulation as much because, in a sense, they get this in their dreaming work. Just like the stalker doesn't do too much dreaming work, they get what they get in uh, in alternate realities from the various practices they do here. So it's also a sense of knowing, uh, is this a practice that's really important for you based on your your design? And if so, how much is right for you to do? Do you need to do partially, a little bit, a complete one? It's, It's different for everybody. And you said what you you did a complete one, right? And it took you years. Yeah. 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 It took me four and a half years. Yeah. And I did it. I did mine in blocks of time. So I didn't like do four years straight. I would do like, let's say I would do um, university. So I would start with my university list and my experiences. And maybe that would take me, you know, a month or six weeks or something. And then I would take a week or two break. And then I would go to another period. So I did it in, I did it in segments. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the whole thing took four and a half years to finish. And to be honest, when I had done it, I felt like it wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, it was hard. It was boring, actually. In a lot of cases, it was revealing. It showed me, it showed me how robotic I'd been in a lot of my life, how boring I'd been. Um, <laughs> but I thought, but it's, it's it's so what? It's not that big a deal. And then two weeks later, I had an experience that I wrote about in Falling for Truth that revealed a hidden part of my past. It was like I had to review my whole life, even though I couldn't see this key event. And then it just revealed itself two weeks later. And that's when I realized, oh, this is why now I understood recapitulation. You do the whole process so that once it's done, the hidden stuff has nowhere left to hide and it will now come up in your life. So yeah, yeah. Wow. So that must be like going through that process. There must be a lot of processing, right? I mean, yeah, there's boring parts, but then like the parts that they're going to use against you is like, um, you know, you hurt your sister when you were five years old and, and, and Mm -hmm. look at the pain you caused, you know, and it's like, and you're going to feel so guilty and shameful over that action. Right. And so the point of doing this is to process through those feelings now mm-hmm. so that they can't be used against you later, right? Exactly. That's that's describing it perfectly. So that that experience has been seen, understood. You've you've transformed yourself somehow from it. You've seen how you could turn that into something useful, even though the experience, if you could go back, you would change it, but you can't, but you you've learned from it. And so, yeah, I've had lots of those where I've had to say, well, that was not a good way to be, but okay, that, that's, I understand that now. And I know the experience is gone when I can put that person sort of mentally in front of my face and I have no, I have no feeling at all towards them. It's like, I'm, it's like someone I've never met. They're a stranger. As long as I, someone can, will come up and I'll st- I can still have a feeling. I like them. I dislike them, uh, you know, of this or that. There's, it's not complete. There's more that needs to be cleaned through. But when the person comes up and you're just like, I don't even know who this is, you know, okay, you're done. Yeah. You're done with that person. Yeah. It, it's all, yeah. it's, it's all even though. 
It's so it's so very the process sounds so very similar to what we actually do in quantum healing and in regressing and healing the past in order to heal the present. You know, it's kind of like the same thing, like working through those things until you don't have that emotional reaction anymore and you're able yeah. to find forgiveness for yourself and others. Um so yeah. you you also so mentioned the trick of doing the whole life though is the bizarre thing is to see the loops you start to see the re what's recurring how many things have happened again and again and again how many periods of my life are exactly the same they've just this slightly different location but actually it's exactly the same and so we start to see just this massive whirlpool of our life that we think is so unique and so different, we start to see actually, that's one of the reasons you can finish a life recapitulation and see your whole life because you don't actually have to see every single second of it. You start to realize that every second you see is like thousands of other seconds, you're seeing mm -hmm. them at the same time. It's, it's, this, mm -hmm. it's a weird thing you yeah. begin to learn as you're doing it. No. Yeah, we've definitely been that's coming up a lot lately are these time loops like the secular nature of this reality and how things keep coming back around and back around and back around. It's it's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Um, one of the questions that came up around recapitulation um, came from Joe and he wanted to ask you, does everyone have to go through a life review? Um some people say that agreeing to actually having the life review gives consent to these entities to trap you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, technically, I, I think if you've if you've if you're comfortable with your understanding of your life now, then you'd be. It, I could be very easy. And again, assuming we can keep our conscious awareness in the after death state, this is also so important because if you're not working with lucid dreaming you're not working with out-of-body experiences the chance that you're going to hit the after death realm and not get caught by that too not get just immediately like you do in a dream and believe it so we've already got that part of having to stay really aware and conscious but if you're aware and conscious and you feel it and you truly know there's nothing in my life that uh, is a surprise then it's really easy to just say yeah you have no authority you have no authority over my life. So I think that's actually the best way to be able to go through it is to just refuse the whole thing because you know you are more powerful than these beings can ever be. That's the, the great uh, Cathar piece of information is that the, the, the soul or the essence part of us is greater than the, greater than the demiurge, greater than the, even the AI mm -hmm. creator of this whole place. And we just have to know that and be it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's good to have the life review ready or the life recapitulation ready just in case you get a bit tricked into having it start then at least <laughs> at least you still know but they can't trick me even if it begins even if it begins against my will there's nothing they can do there that can that can shock me or surprise me or guilt me because that's guilt or shame is two of the number one emotions not just that's used against us while we're alive that's going to be used against us in the after death round there's no question those two emotions regret guilt, shame, yeah. or of course, on the opposite side, love, you know, they're mm -hmm. also going to for sure, whatever it is you love, particularly if you couldn't have it in this life, whether it's a person or an experience or a, they're going to tempt you with that to all ends of the earth. So you've got to be ready for that too, to not just reject the one side, you've got to be able to reject that thing that could really tempt you in a positive way. So it's all part of this preparing, I think, for life review. But I would agree with Joe. If you, I think if you can be that aware and just, again, stand in your own total authority of just, no, I don't, you, you have no authority over this. So mm -hmm. next. Yeah. What, what's next on the list? Yeah. I think there's another piece of that too. It's like, even, even if you don't agree to having a life review and that's your stance on that and you have the conscious awareness mm -hmm. to say no um the other part of that is like guilt and shame and regret are the lowest vibrational energies we can carry within our system so it's it's also a good idea not to be carrying those in like after we leave the body so we want to release all of that here now you know so that we're not yeah. taking it with us into onto yeah. the other side yeah couldn't agree more. You do you agree as well, Karen? Absolutely. We're all about the healing. Like we try to promote the healing. Like you have to try to do exactly what you said. Like, <clears throat> I guess with everything, like with the triggering points and it is, 
recapitulate recapitulation every day it pretty much is like everything that we're seeing so until to the point where like you said you have that person in front of you and you feel nothing that you know it's complete it's the same with the triggers exactly the same thing yeah uh, yeah yep. I'm worried about the whole lucid dreaming stuff. Um, I've been telling this to Tina. I'm like, when I dream, um, I get trapped. So I'm like, I don't know if I'm how to work on that. Um, I feel like um, I there's so much more that I need to do in order for me to become so aware, even in dreams, because there's a part of yeah. me that feels split where I know I'm dreaming, but it's not, it never crosses to the point of being lucid so i'm like nice. do you have any tricks there yeah no you're in that mid in that in between state of mm -hmm. you're knowing but you can't act you're, yeah. you're, you're like i'm in limbo you're clear witnesser but yeah and and one thing i've found in in the dreams that either i can fully remember when i get up or the ones i get lucid a bit in is i notice how many people appear in my dream usually of course people you know very closely um why do i believe that's who that is who i'm experiencing um more often than not it's it's yeah it's another entity playing with you it's another entity masking yeah. mm -hmm. as particularly someone that you feel close to or did feel close to as a way of manipulating you one of the weirdest things i've noticed and, and others are probably who are watching can relate to this too you dream about somebody mm -hmm. in your and, you know even if it's a simple dream you get up and all of a sudden, you're drawn to do very odd um, uh, things in, in your morning that you would normally never do. And you're realizing it's it's somehow linked to the old memory of this person. And it's somehow, but wait a minute, something is trying to get me to do these things that a giant distraction of my energy. This is not useful in any way. It's actually, so something in the dream was actually trying to set up the triggers for later in the day as distraction points. So it's also mm -hmm. this whole idea of like, really being careful with what we've dealt with in our dream and yeah. what we're still yeah. carrying out of it to yeah. cle even cleanse the dream out of us yes yes, yes that's a cleanse good way to the dream it. that's been coming up a lot too is cleansing the dream realm because they will do exactly that they plant stuff in our subconscious that they especially like emotional um those and mm -hmm. lower vibrational emotional energies they will plant those in the subconscious with the hopes that we're going to carry them even if we just carry that energy into our day, we're still carrying those lower vibrational feelings within us. But when they have you acting out on things, that's a, that's another level. So maybe, um, you know, before we get out of bed in the morning, we can hold the intention of clearing whatever they've implanted, like during the night so that we're not. Ooh, that's a really good that. one. Well, that's actually interesting that you just said that because I had that idea today when I got up before I even got out of bed to be like I'm clearing everything that I dreamt because like I have no idea what was going on like I felt like I had the the, the mind wipe so that mm -hmm. I couldn't but I remember the feelings of it but you know like how they're so yeah. you could kind of identify it, but it's so far mm -hmm. yeah that's what I was feeling so I'm like I'm gonna clear this because I don't know what this is yeah. and I don't want to carry that to set the tone of my day yeah yeah. Maybe we should set that as an experience for everyone watching this. Why don't you do this as a practice for seven days? Yeah. Clear out your dream energy with nothing going on. And then like in the team and Karen's next video, the one after this one, if that's had an impact, let them know in the comments as a way of seeing, is this actually, did this actually have an effect? Because I think that's something, if it's working, everybody should know about it. And yeah. so it becomes like a, the, the group here can become yeah. like a little science experiment. <laughs> oh, no, totally. I, I love agree. experiments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So another question I had was about um, the action plan for death. Do you mm -hmm. want to talk about a little bit about that and why that's important? Sure. That came out of actually this guy's book, which was mm -hmm. okay. It's William Bullman's Adventures in the Afterlife. Um, it's an okay book, but it has a very happy message, uh, which I don't necessarily agree with, but his story is interesting. <laughs> but he did make, at the end of it, he did make an, an idea. And again, in his case, it's, he believes he's going to a super happy place when he dies, but he's setting up the condition. He's, he's consciously saying, why don't you set up the conditions? I mean, death is the most important experience we're going to have. It's an important, the most important trans transition that's going to happen. 
why are we not preparing what we want around us in the few days before we die to prepare us? So he's saying, why don't, assuming you don't get hit by a bus and it's just instantaneous, right? If it's like, you, it's going to be something that you can consciously be a part of. Why would we not choose? Where do we want to be? Who do we want to have around us? Um, what sort of music do we want to have playing? Yeah, he, he suggested making a CD of, of certain affirmations that you might want to say, like in his, it was, uh, I'll, actually, I'll just, just for, for the sake of our conversation, let's see what some of his were in um, <laughs> his piece. It was things like, um, I am completely safe, secure, and loved. Uh, now I forgive everyone, including myself. Unconditional love flows through me. Uh, all of my fears and limits are dissolved away. Okay. For us, we could potentially say things like, you know, I am complete essence. Uh, I will be returning home. Um, this, this realm, I have more authority. I have total authority. I am I stand in my totality. Um, the, the, the demiurge does not control me. Like, whatever. We can have the things that are right for us for the journey track. we want to have. Yeah. <laughs> Because for me, the whole, I guess if I had to sum this up, where's this all taking me? It's just the realization of that I'm done here. I'm like Dolores and Maeve in Westworld. I've, I've, uh, the memory wipes have somehow in their own way stopped. And now I've seen the truth of reality and I'm just, I'm done with this and mm -hmm. I'm going home. Yeah. I'm, I'm going home. Yes, <laughs> me and too. That's it. Absolutely. And, yeah, and if, if, if that helps others along the way too, you might say come home at the same time. So that's great. But I know 100% I'm going home. I'm not, there, there's, there's nothing that this realm is going to, is going to trick me with anymore. Yeah. And that's somehow, again, can you put that into your death action plan? Because it's a wonder, because they, they always say that hearing is the last sense to go when you're dying. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to have something that's, that's there. That's, that's almost affirmation like or focus that you, even though you're, you're out, you're not fully out yet you get a couple of more reminders of like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. So that mm -hmm. you're taking that into the after death realm. And again, you're, you know, you're ready, you're, you're lucid, you're aware. So it made sense to, to put together your death action plan. And mm -hmm. again, like for some people, they don't think about it. And then all of a sudden they're on their deathbed and people come to visit them that they don't want to see, you know, yeah. I don't want to see that person <laughs> again, you know, or whatever. And like, so it's, it's, it's yeah. your death experience. It's your personal experience. You can make it however you want it to be. And then just have somebody close to you who's willing to, you know, I'd say follow the wishes to create the environment that you want. It makes complete sense. Yeah. I totally love that mm -hmm. um, idea because, you know, death can be such a taboo subject in society as a whole. I mean, we talk about it all the time because I want to normalize it. I don't want it to be this taboo yeah. subject. I think right. we, every day we're one step closer to death. So like we need to come to terms with it at some point. And um, also what that reminded me of, like having that CD or someone like recite it to you reminded me of the Tibetan Book of the Dead where that was created for them to help guide uh, souls or spirits after death onto right. the other side to get them through the right. realms into the clear light of awareness. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, I just, I love that, that idea, the new take on that idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's brilliant. So, yeah. And I, I can't in any way take any kind of credit for that. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Totally his. <laughs> well, no, I do yeah. agree. That's, that's pretty darn smart. I have, I have to give yeah, credit for that. Yeah. And what's interesting too about that book is that a couple of people are reading it in our group now. I actually read it a couple of months ago. Um, yeah. yeah. And a couple of people are reading it now. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah it, his, his experiences are really interesting though. So it's worth it mm -hmm. to read just for his experiences. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, you know, he still has the belief that he's going to a happy, happy place and all those things. I will say though, like, the the higher realms you know it's it's not all bad there it's just that it's still part of the system right you know it's not That's like scary issue. bad like ugly entities come and get you it's just yep it's You're it's that fake good still here. right it's that <laughs> yeah. fake but that false yeah. light kind of it's, energy yeah you're still here yeah. and and with the right conditions you'll just drop right back into the yeah. lower realms again yeah that's yeah. that's the problem it's and I know that there's many, we might call them souls, that will get trapped in those realms. They'll, they'll find a fairly comfortable, happy place, and they'll just, they'll, they'll park themselves there 
for maybe a long, long time, mm -hmm. but then something will stir, something will happen, and all of a sudden, tumble, 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 you're right back in again. So yeah. all of these things, like I say, there's so many tricks. Yeah. Um, and it, it's maybe next time you can come back, we ready. can talk about all the tricks. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You know, we have magic shows. <laughs> Okay, Haldi, is there anything else you feel is important to share with us today? I think we've talked about a tremendous amount of areas. And I, I think for me, it's been so nice because um, talking with, you might say, talking with those who are already in the same place and are sharing the same kind of information, this has been such a different conversation for me because it's more like, it's not like any kind of interview or conversation. It's like, we're just we're from the same group we've just given lectures at some conference and now we've been sitting having coffee after the <laughs> lectures and we're talking about our own experiences and this is like um this is where actually real powerful stuff can come about and more information can, can bubble to the surface than sort of just standard discussion of the topic and i hope more of this can happen because um i'll be quite surprised it's quite surprising i i sent feelers out to there's a number of people talking about these subjects now so far, you're the only one of them that wanted to have a discussion about it. And I really? found that very strange. Yeah, really? I found that very, very strange. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of interviews with a number of people who are interesting, I've interviewed with before, but it's just odd that I would have thought the people who are in this community, this would be the first thing you'd want to have deeper discussions about. So uh, I'm also really thankful that you guys were doing this and because I know what can come of it and what can come for the people watching it. So uh Thanks yeah. for that. No, we appreciate you reaching yeah, and I guess out. If yeah, and if people are I guess, are interested in the material, um, the book is over on my very poorly named website, <laughs> Egyptian-wisdom-revealed.com. Uh, you can get to exit the cave right now. It is just a PDF file. It's a minimum $5 donation for that. Um, but the print book is ready in a couple of weeks, and I'm hopeful to have an audio book sometime in November. Yay. But I wanted to get the print book out early because I knew when I started working on this book in early May that the first two weeks of November were going to be explosive. I knew that one way or another, this world is not going to is not going to be smooth. It's going to be a really bumpy ride. And I wanted this material available for anybody who wanted it, even in a in a more simplistic form, who might want it in a print book. But you know, I just needed to get it out. And this is a message I want to share with everybody. If you think there's information that's important to you, and it doesn't, I don't mean mine, I mean anybody's, whether it's a book, whether it's information on somebody's website, whether it's a video, go get it now. Don't think in two to three months, it's still going to be there and it's still going to be available. We don't really know what's coming in two to three months. Might be there. Things might not be. So take advantage of this. Uh, take advantage of everything you think is helpful to you now. Have it available get a uh, habit, you know, and if everything is still wonderful in December and January, great, you've already got it. If things do go in a bizarre way, you've got extra stuff for your own journey for your own preparation. So I'm just sharing that with everyone. Well, thank you for that. Is there yes. anything specific that you feel is going to happen or just a, a general feeling? Uh, we've got there's so many balls in the air right now, there are so many potential explosive elements in the world. Yeah. And there's no way they can keep juggling them all continuously. One of them's going to fall. That's yeah. almost guaranteed. One of them's going to fall. I can't, I couldn't predict which one, but no matter what, it's going to create. Because for me, I feel that, I mean, we're in the great reset and that's guaranteed. That's happening right now. Uh, but the problem is people don't recognize what it really is. It's a, it's a reset of energy. That's mm -hmm. what's being reset. It's an energetic reset for the entire AI system, for the entire uh, reality that we're in. That's what's being, not, not the financial system, not the governments, not the, no, no. It's the, it's the way the loose energy is being harvested. That's what's being reset. It got reset a number of few hundred years ago, I think, at the time of the World Fairs. And I wrote that book. It's happened many times. Robert Monroe talks about these changes. So when you start to understand what's going on now is energetic, it's all about how energy is going to be moving from the creatures into the system everything that's happening makes complete sense and it also means that i think you get you're two steps ahead of it then if you actually know what what's what the purpose of it is you can navigate so much easier than thinking it's something else is going on now yeah 
character. That's probably why we got hit so hard. Yeah. 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 And actually, to me, it makes sense because they're they're trying to merge the human with the robot, the human with the AI. And mm -hmm. that would make sense that if, if this is an energy harvesting system and you have the harvesting device here and you have, let's say, the human here, there's a space between the two. That's energy loss as the energy is moving from one to the other. If you could plug the human directly into the system, which is kind of what this is supposed to do, well, there's no energy loss. You actually, yeah. you actually need less of everything because there's no waste. The energy harvested is going directly into the system. So actually, again, from this concept, it makes complete sense that that's what they're trying to do. It's, it's, a energy minim, it's a waste minimalizing system that's being set up. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so well said, Howdy. Thank you yes. so, so much for being here and sharing all of your wisdom and knowledge with yeah. us. We really appreciated having you. Um, just stick around for a minute. I'm going to end the video. Uh, Karen, you want to say anything before we go? No, just a big old thank you. Um, how do you like what I love about how you present the information? It's so grounded and it's mm -hmm. so open. It's not one like this is what the truth is. It's like you hold all the truths and you kind of just accept it all it's not attaching it's just accepting right. it all and that's exactly we align with that completely your work yeah. is really resonant and uh we really appreciate it and we can't wait to see what more research you will share in the future yeah all thanks right so everyone much, guys. thanks for having me yeah thank you so much for being thanks. here and thanks to everyone for hanging out with us today and listening we hope you're well out there and we're sending you all of our love Thanks so much. See you next time.